so good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning or afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. This is our third webinar in the second series, um, and it's on climate change adaptation. Uh, my name is Natalie Groves, and I'm a market executive here at Kundal. So as I said, this is our second series now um, during lockdown or if you're kind of coming out of lockdown. Uh, we hoped we might be back into some kind of normality, but um, it's been a great opportunity, these webinars, for us to share our expertise, share what we've been learning and also continue to learn from everyone who's been on the call, who's been asking questions and driving some really good discussions. So as we kick off this webinar, please feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, you should have a chat function or question and answer box at the bottom. So just send them through and we'll pick them up on the way. If we run out of time and we don't have a chance to answer your question, don't worry, they're all recorded. So what we'll do is we'll send you an email as long as you don't tick the anonymous button um, and we'll send you your answer via email. The webinar will last about half an hour um, and the guys have got quite a lot to cram into that time. It is being recorded, so it'll be available on YouTube uh, once this is over, hopefully by tomorrow. So if you do have to log out or want to share it with your colleagues, then please feel free to do that. So on to our speakers today, we've got James Spears and David Brownstein. So David is a senior engineer in our sustainability team. and He's got um, just shy of 10 years experience. He specializes in strategies for both climate change mitigation and adaptation. James is a geotechnical engineer by trade, but leads the climate change adaptation strategy within Kundal. He also sits on the Institute of Civil Engineers Working Group, developing their sustainability roadmap. So I shall now hand over to Dave. Good morning. Thank you, Natalie. That's great. Hope everyone is well. Um, yeah, my name's Dave, so I'll be, uh, I'll be taking you through the, the first half of the webinar, giving you uh, an overview of um, uh, what climate change impacts we can expect to see, uh, some of the risks that this poses for the uh, built environment, uh, and um, what you can do to adapt to these risks uh, before I hand over to James to give you uh, an engineer's perspective on all of that. So... Um, so we're uh, Kundal, we're uh, a multidisciplinary engineering consultancy established in 1976. So over 40 years ago, um, we have uh, 950 people worldwide and at the moment 950 offices worldwide. Um, and importantly, we are the first uh, One Planet company to be endorsed under the bioregional uh, One Planet Living Framework. Um, and these, you can see there, are some of the locations that we operate out of. So we really are a, a, an international uh, one collaborative business operating across the globe. So, um, at Kundal, we practice what we preach by putting sustainability at the heart of, uh, of what we do. And uh, to, to, to demonstrate this, in 2018, we undertook a materiality review of our business to really try and understand where we, uh, as a company, could have the greatest impact and, and really play the most effective role uh, in achieving our ambitions. And, and out of that came our six key priority impact areas. Uh, which consists of things such as health and well-being, uh, zero carbon energy, uh, and of course, climate change adaptation, which we're speaking to you about today. Uh, we recognize very much that not enough was being done in the industry to address the growing threat of climate change. Uh, and our goal is to ensure that the projects we deliver take these risks into account. Uh, but also, we wanted to spearhead uh, the much needed change in the industry by undertaking research uh, and we've recently published a seminal guide on behalf of the BCO on the topic uh, which is currently available to members but should be available more widely over the coming months. Um, so you'll no doubt agree that these are very challenging times and uh, uncertain times that we're living in but if there's one thing that we've seen during uh, this crisis it's that it's been the extraordinary ability of people, communities, businesses to pull together and adapt on a massive scale to what is a significant global threat. Uh, thankfully, it seems we're now beginning to emerge out of the other side of this. Uh, and in doing so, we need to turn our eyes to the other impending crisis, which is that of climate change. Uh, and this represents a much greater global threat environmentally, economically and socially than the, uh, than anything we've seen. 
Uh, and as a result of the, uh, the crisis, the world's CO2 emissions are expected to fall by around 8% this year. Uh, and this is roughly in line with the reductions that are required to meet the Paris Agreement's aspirational uh, limits to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. But these reductions would need to be maintained year on year for the next decade. So it really remains to be seen how we will continue to address the challenge ahead. Uh, our ability to flatten the curve of climate change both in terms of lessening its impact, but also in adapting to its effect, uh, will require that same collective endeavour to overcome. Uh, as we know, climate change from human activity, uh, sorry, carbon emissions from human activity causes global warming, or more accurately, global heating, uh, as, as these uh, gases trap the sun's energy in the atmosphere. Um, and the trends of temperature increase both globally and in the UK are very, very clear, uh, as you can see from the, uh, the, the barcode diagram uh, on, on, on the screen. And um, however you look at it, I could show you a dozen graphics just like this, then they all show the same thing, that the planet is getting hotter and we're the cause of this. Um, and this is, is really shown by the way that all of the top 10 hottest years ever in the UK have occurred since 2002. So there's, there's a very clear uh, trend of, of warming that we're seeing. And of course, we've just come out of a, a, of a bout of lovely spring weather, and I love the sunshine as much as anyone. Uh, and it certainly helped ease things during lockdown. But this is actually part of a much larger pattern of influence that we're starting to have over our climate. Uh, we transitioned from the wettest February on record straight into the driest April on record, which was then quickly broken by the driest and sunniest May on record. Uh, and these records uh, and this kind of contrast is very, very unusual. Uh, but this is exactly the type of change that climate models have been predicting would happen. Um, these, uh, these, these very large swings from, uh, from very pronounced extreme weather uh, and these are showing that these will become more common as the climate becomes more unpredictable. So we know very well the impact that climate change is already having, and we recognize our need to reduce carbon emissions to mitigate that. So we stand at a bit of a crossroads. Uh, with our continued burning of fossil fuels, the warming of our planet will increase. How much this increases by depends on what we do from this point forward. The more greenhouse gases we release into the atmosphere, the more the planet will warm and the greater the impact and risks to society. Uh, climate change is partly a game of risk. Unfortunately, we can't predict the future trajectory of emissions. This is dependent on things like politics, economics, technology, uh, population, land use, all of these things. Um, and all of these things are very uncertain in themselves. Um, but what we do know is that average global temperatures are already 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels. We also know that to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, we need to limit this to no more than one and a half degrees. Uh, and even with global efforts, we're still on track for a 3.2 degree temperature rise. So you can see we're still some ways of where we need to be uh, in terms of hitting this target. Uh, so really the need to act uh, quickly is really, really pressing, but there's still numerous pathways that emissions could take. Uh, and these pathways are known as, uh, as emissions scenarios, and they're a powerful tool in enabling us to understand climate change impacts so that we can analyze multiple outcomes, weigh up risks and costs and plan accordingly. Uh, we could see a global green recovery from the current crisis, which sees strong and urgent action to com combat climate change. Or we could see a relapse to a fossil fuel powered linear economy with little to no effort to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and the honest answer is we just don't know exactly where things will head, which is why it's very important to understand the range of possible uh, pathways. Um, really trying to strive for the best, try and achieve that low emission scenario, but planning for the worst, those high or very high emission scenarios, uh, if that uh, necessary reduction doesn't occur. So uh, we're recommending that our designs consider a, a medium emission scenario as a minimum, but understand the risks of a high emission scenario to enable clients to plan accordingly if, uh, if that uh, 
ends up um, being the case. So maybe you're thinking, okay, well, if we do end up with a low emission scenario and we, uh, we mitigate uh, climate change quickly, then I won't really need to worry too much about the impacts. But that unfortunately just isn't true. Uh, our 1.1 degrees has already changed the climate beyond the point that much of the built environment is designed for. Um, and our emissions from previous decades will continue to raise, um, will continue to change the climate uh, for decades to come. And, and sea level rise is a good example of that, where it is responding to the emissions that have happened over the previous decades, and it will continue to rise irrespective of what our emissions do in the future. So it's not a question of whether our climate will look different in 30 years, years time. It's a question of how different. Um, and our seas will be higher, which will substantially reduce the effectiveness of coastal flood defences. Uh, we could experience extreme heat waves such as that in 2003 uh, every other year or even more frequently than that. Uh, the flood stories that scatter the news every winter will become an ever more regular occurrence as the intensity of rainfall uh, increases up to a third more um, and then that will be accompanied by an overall decrease in summer rainfall. But unfortunately, what little rain does fall will come in much shorter, more intense bursts, leading to greater instances of both drought uh, and flooding as uh, drainage systems uh, and river systems are overwhelmed. And bearing in mind that at this point, the building you've just constructed is only halfway through its design life and the picture for the other half of the century is far, far worse as runaway climate change further accelerates. So that is why mitigation is so important, but also adaptation to the damage that has already been done and will continue uh, to be done uh, in the future. Uh, and that brings me to what is a key point, which is the importance of efforts for both mitigation and adaptation and understanding the difference between them. Uh, mitigation is about efforts to reduce carbon emissions and prevent the worst impacts of climate change. Things such as uh, transition towards clean energy, passive design, low carbon materials. Whereas adaptation on the other side of that means taking action to help cope with the effects of climate change that will occur. So things like sea and flood defenses, uh, behavioral change, but also, uh, as I've shown, passive design as well, because that is an effective means of, uh, of achieving both mitigation and help uh, adapting to, to higher temperatures in future. So um, the distinction uh, between them is not always clear and often there is some crossover. But collectively, uh, both of these things are very important for an organization or a project to be addressing. Um, sustainability has traditionally been in reference to mitigation. Uh, and as we've seen, this has grown rapidly over the past decades to finally become a driving force in the industry. Uh, but I also believe we're at that point with adaptation as well, where we're, we're very much at the start of that adaptation journey, but we don't have decades um, to uh, to increase our uh, capabilities in, in, in this, this space. So, so I'm going to take you through some of the key risks that climate change poses to the built environment. Uh, and also some of the steps that you can take to adapt to these. So the built environment is, of course, many things to many people. So I've split the building's life cycle down into, uh, into these stages where you have development and investment, which is um, those essentially who make money from property, uh, construction, which is those who build property, and then the design and operation. So that's those who design and those who occupy uh, property to try and make it relevant to the to the appropriate people but of course um, there's a lot of overlap within these so really there's some relevance uh, to everyone uh, in all of these sections um, it was the CEO of BlackRock who said that climate change risk is investment risk uh, and anyone who deals in property as an investment is used to dealing with these risks uh, and these really exist across four key areas uh, you have um, the impact on value and investment where the increased exposure of assets, assets to physical risks uh, can increase the costs and reduce the value uh, and even result in, uh, in stranded assets over time. Uh, you have legislative risk. Uh, we're starting to see the reporting of climate risk exposure uh, become more prevalent 
uh, and eventually that's expected to move from a voluntary requirement to a mandatory requ requirement as it's increasingly tightened over time. Um, there is already uh, sections within planning policy to, uh, to account for climate change adaptation. So the mechanism for local authorities um, to introduce additional uh, and more stringent requirements on project is already there. And this is something that is, um, is expected to increase over time as well. Uh, reputational risks as well, just as we've seen with a change in sentiment towards climate change mitigation with net zero carbon and people's awareness of that. So too, are we expecting to see towards climate adaptation? Uh, investors will want to ensure their assets are climate resilient um, and uh, customer expectations as well will change around this as well. And then also we're seeing funding uh, linked to increasingly stringent ESG criteria, again, predominantly around mitigation at the moment, but expected to include more about climate adaptation in the future. So uh, what can you do? Well, firstly, you can act proactively, not waiting to be caught off guard by external changes uh, or pressures and actually implementing sustainability strategies, which include both mitigation and adaptation to ensure that developments and investments are taking these into account. Um, on the other side as well, being diligent in investment decisions by ensuring they're publicly disclosing their climate change risks as part of wider ESG criteria. Um, and uh, understanding and disclosing the risks to your own assets uh, and ensuring they have a suitable adaptation and uh, plan in place for uh, coping with climate change as, it, uh, as we see the effects increase. Um, and there's a number of frameworks to enable this, such as TCFD, uh, Gresby, and the CDP as well. So there's, there, there are a few ways to actually um, uh, disclose these risks. Uh, and then sustainability is a rapidly changing field, so it's only through effective horizon scanning uh, and research that organizations can get a sense of what upcoming changes in things such as legislation, industry guidance, and stakeholder expectations uh, might be. But often, one of the most effective means of adaptation are not necessarily at a building scale or an asset scale. They might be at a much wider city or regional scale. So engaging with policymakers on, uh, on what resilience strategies they have in place um, could be effective in helping to protect your own portfolio. And uh, a good example of this is the, uh, the, the Thames barrier. So then um, it brings me to construction, uh, and this is actually one of the most vulnerable sectors uh, to climate change. It involves the assembly of thousands of materials from dozens of suppliers by hundreds of people, um, all while exposed to the mercy of the weather on site. Not only are there physical risks from the impact on site operations, uh, operative welfare and safety, and the behavior of construction materials, but also uh, from a significant reliance on overseas supply chains. And these international risks are thought to be an order of magnitude larger than domestic risks because it exposes contractors, not just to climate change happening in the UK, but happening all over the world. Uh, and there's, there's a few good examples of global supply chains, particularly in, uh, in car manufacturing, being uh, disrupted due to events that, are ha that, that have happened in them. Um, uh, in in Southeast Asia and, uh, and and other locations. So, being resilient in construction, what that means is uh, having climate related risks clearly outlined in the contract. Often there are clauses which cover extreme weather and allocate risk to relevant parties. Um, climate change will alter this risk profile, so contractors need to be aware of their potentially increased exposure. Uh, and ensure that this is dealt with uh, contractually. Uh, risks in the supply chain as well need to be understood as far upstream as possible to make sure that any areas where risks might be concentrated, for example, in certain geographical regions, which are more prone to disruption. And then efforts could be made to manage this by diversifying or having contingencies in place or even switching to a potentially more localized supply chain if possible. Uh, effective site preparation, which is uh, important now, but will become more so uh, 
things such as drainage, material storage, uh, and proper welfare facilities become even more important, uh, as does continually planning uh, for extreme weather events to minimize the risks to disruptions as these events become more uh, frequent and more severe. Uh, and an effective environmental management system is a good way to demonstrate what you are doing, not only uh, to limit your own impact on the environment, but also the environment's impact on you. And there's some additional standards uh, which are emerging to assist organizations with this. So these are uh, expected to become uh, increasingly um, widely used in the industry as well. And then shifting site operations off-site by prioritizing modern methods of construction can reduce some of the risks associated with extreme uh, weather events, um, as well as you know some of the other uh, known benefits that uh, these methods can bring. And then for uh, for those who design and operate buildings, uh, the design of buildings is still based on historic weather data that bears very little resemblance to what we see today, let alone in the future. Um, and really the, the risk there is that we're delivering buildings today that won't be fit for purpose in the very near future. Uh, so the increase in, in heat waves, uh, particularly in, in already risk prone areas such as the Southeast of England, uh, threatens the health and well-being of, of the, uh, the people who occupy these buildings. Uh, and this has obvious uh, social implications, but also real financial implications for businesses. Uh, increasing flood risk, which is already very high in many, many parts of the country, can cause substantial damage, not only to the fabric of buildings themselves, but also to the infrastructure that businesses rely on to operate effectively. So it creates uh, risks that just go beyond the boundary of the building itself. Um, and then buildings which are heavily reliant on comfort cooling may simply become e uneconomical to run. And it's estimated that a quarter of non-domestic buildings uh, are at risk of uh, obsolescence uh, because of this, um, which is, uh, which is a, a, a huge figure. So, so some of the things um, that can be done to become more resilient is uh, firstly, uh, setting sustainability target setting it's becoming increasingly important for organizations uh, and these should include elements of adaptation relying on things such as future weather and climate data uh, to understand the risks and opportunities to your development prioritizing uh, passive design measures as i mentioned which is good for both mitigation and adaptation so these become increasingly important uh, to ensure buildings remain comfortable without consuming excessive energy uh, and nature-based solutions uh, which can play a role in increasing adaptation but also in biodiversity and health and well-being um, and we do have an upcoming uh, webinar on green and blue infrastructure which will uh, touch on this um, and then a plan, really planning for how that building can be adapted over time, which should form part of a building's operation manual. Uh, circular economy principles such as flexibility, adaptability and deconstruction not only help buildings adapt to functional changes, but also to changes in climate. Uh, and finally, adaptation may be as simple as opting to have a plan for extreme weather, such as relaxing set points or dress codes without necessarily needing to make major changes to the building. So hopefully that gives you a good uh, an idea of some of the impacts that climate change is having uh, and the different ways that, these, uh, that this impacts the built environment and the steps you can take to increase resilience against these. So uh, just before I hand over to James, I would like to put a poll out to our audience. Uh, so hopefully that is shown up for everyone. Um, so I've got three questions. Do you currently consider climate change adaptation in your projects? Uh, what do you see as the biggest climate risk to your organization or projects? And um, what do you consider to be the key barrier to adaptation? Well, the poll's running, um, which should be just for a, a minute or so. I guess now is a, a good time to ask one of the questions that's come through, David. So what are some of the, the most eye-opening things that you've found in your research on climate change? Um, the, 
I think it was, uh, I guess I was maybe naively owes of the impression that um, if we work hard enough towards mitigation and reducing our carbon emissions, then, you know, we, we won't really have to worry too much. We won't change our climate too much and it won't have as uh, that big an impact. But, but as I've said, that's quite uh, incorrect. You know, there, there's, we've, we've been burning fossil fuels for hundreds of years and, uh, that's done quite a lot of damage, which will continue to change our climate over the um, uh, over the, the coming decades. So it, it was just really understanding that um, even in a best case scenario, we still have to adapt. We've still done enough damage to our climate um, to you know increase the risk to our uh, built environment. Um, so, uh, and then the other side of that was that you know the industry is just very very unprepared for for many of those changes. So that was quite eye opening. We've got a few more questions that have come through, but we'll we'll cover them at the end because I appreciate James is has got his section now. Grand, Bring in the bit, <laughs> grand. Thank you, Natalie. So I'm going to give you just a bit of a an approach that how I look at things really as an engineer designing and, and advising on on projects and. The first thing to think about really is how realistic is everything that David's talked about. And an interesting example from earlier in the year was from Network Rail. Um, we had a lot of flooding in, in Wales earlier in the year, as I'm sure everyone's aware of. And they noted that this was a, a once in a generation event. And it, it really isn't. Everything, as David said, is, is completely true. We've got to expect this, this sort of weather um, to be happening more and more regularly. And we need to prepare for it. And actually, the, the Cabinet Office, um, every four years, they produce a, a national risk register for things that might affect the UK. The last one was 2017. And up in the, the, some of the highest risks we have there, uh, various types of flooding, <clears throat> as well as heat waves as well, all things which are affected by, by climate change. And the eagle-eyed will spot this little thing up here, which is the severe risk of an influenza outbreak. Um, so good job we were prepared for that one. <laughs> um, and when I start to, to look at adaptation and how we should approach it, I tend to break it down into to three different areas, really. There's, there's the obvious one of adapting to the, the future climate itself, the sort of impacts from weather changes we're going to see. But then I also need to think about how is regulation going to change? How is that going to affect um, what I might be designing, how it might be used, how it might need to be used in the future? Also, I need to think about future living. How do we want to live as a society? How might society change? And unless we think about all of these things together, we don't really have true resilience. You know, it needs to be a holistic approach. Otherwise, we risk of putting all our money in one pot, so to speak, and it, it not really turning out. Now, if we go to the, the weather impacts first, which, which David's touched upon, um, I think for, for critical assets and infrastructure, we, we should really go for a high emissions scenario or very high emission scenario. And that's what the Environment Agency recommends in their latest climate tool from earlier in the year. And when we look at this 30 to 60 year period, which is kind of covering both when a lot of us will, will still be working um, and when pretty much everything we design will still be within its design life, we have some huge, huge impacts there. Even at the 30-year period, we're looking at heat waves every, every two years, but we go to 60 years, it's a few times every year. The average rainfall increase is huge, 44 to 75%, but it's the intensity increase, which, which is the real key, not just the averages. So a 20 to 40% increase in rainfall intensity. And e even then, when we had the rain back in February, that was a 400% increase um, on, on a on a typical February month. So we've got some huge increases there we need to be aware of and try and plan for, as well as the more obvious ones we're probably aware of in terms of higher sea levels. And when that combines with um, sort of storm surge events as well, we have a much bigger impact and we, we need to be ready for them. So, so what do we do? Where, where do we start with this? Well, pick that emission scenario first because that will dictate your climate impacts, what your weather changes are going to be. You might even choose, choose a range of scenarios so you know the sort of range of effects you might be seeing. And then the easiest way to start is to actually do a, do a risk assessment, either on your scope as a designer or an advisor or the particular asset that you're managing or looking after. And just look through what every little element might be on that and see how it can be affected by those different weather changes and, and risk assess it, see what's high risk, see what's low risk. You can then 
try and mitigate those risks by either changing or tweaking designs, increasing flood barrier heights, doing something about cooling methods, or the other option is to go, you know what, we're not so fussed about that being knocked out for a few weeks time. So you accept the loss in resilience there. But what you can do then is you can plan for it, including planning for recovery as well. So if you've got a, a car park area that might flood, you might go, actually, that's okay. We can live with that. But you have a plan in place for recovering it, cleaning it, bringing it back into, op into operation uh, afterwards. So you're thinking about all this stuff in advance. And the other thing to be aware of when you think about this is what I'd call cascade effects. Um, often a lot of infrastructure and similar things are, are multi-purpose. So we, we have a bridge here, it was in Tadcaster that was damaged during a flood event. And the obvious thing there is that the, we can't use the bridge anymore to access one side or the other. So you might have a site off to one side of this bridge, which is perfectly flood resilient, but you can't access it now. But the big impact here is actually all of the water, the gas, the electric was knocked out in this bridge as well. So not only might your site be unaccessible, but all the utilities have been knocked out as well. And perhaps you can't get to that site to prevent damage uh, being caused by this lack of utility provision. So you need to think about what else is affecting your site outside of it as well, not just within these sort of red line boundaries, so to speak. Also designing the standards isn't always enough. You know, we, we can use the latest guidance, but that might not be taken into account um, the effects of climate change. Um, this is a bit of an example here. So back in 2012, the British Geological Survey did some research on shrinkable clays, um, which kind of typically year to year costs about half a billion pounds in the UK. On a, on a bad year with sort of um, drought periods, we'll have about one and a half billion pounds worth of claims. So a huge, huge impact there. That's only going to get worse now because of climate change. But if we use the latest guidance on this, even NHBC guidance from 2020, it doesn't allow for this. So sometimes if we want to be truly resilient, we've got to go beyond what, what guidance is and what standards are. So do be careful and check what weather data, what climate data your standards and guidance are using because it might not be enough. So when should we go about this? Well, as soon as we can, really. As soon as you're looking at a site, looking at an asset, think straight away, right, what could affect this? If you're doing diligence on the site, what's going to happen on the site itself, but also what's going to happen outside the site and adjacent to it? You know, you might have a perfectly safe site from flooding, but if you've got an area of unstable ground near it that can collapse, cause landslides, and then damage your site, it's not really resilient. Likewise, it could wipe out um, utilities, as I've discussed before, or cut off access. So make sure you don't just limit yourself just to the site. At the design stage, we've already discussed increasing capacity of, of items, be it flooding or for cooling, that sort of thing. But also think about your, your design for resilience and rapid recovery afterwards. And again, think outside of your site as well. It's great having this wonderful flood resilient site, but if you can't get to it, is it really resilient? Probably not. And again, as David's mentioned before, we, we've got a, uh, another webinar next week on, on blue green infrastructure, which will cover some of this a bit more, which might be useful. Construction stage is also very important and will be impacted a huge amount. Site workers, in particular, um, during heavy weather periods in terms of heavy rain, you know, we've got increased risk of slips, trips, falls, as well as not being able to, to operate machinery, probably bogging down. But heat waves are actually much more dangerous because. If you get slightly dehydrated, it's actually the same effect as being um, drinking and driving effectively. And you wouldn't want a drunk plant operator driving a crane around a site. So we need to think about how we can protect our site workers, how we can educate them, how we protect them from weather. Temporary works are also incredibly vulnerable um, to, to weather events, be it flooding or sometimes actually heat wave from, from shrinkages and effects on propping. So again, we need to think about what do we need to do there if a weather event occurs? It doesn't mean we need to over-design. It just means we need to plan for it. So make sure someone's looking at a week ahead, what's happening with the weather? Do we have a storm occurring? Then what do we need to put into place in advance to pretend, uh, prevent a risk, risk occurring? So the other thing I mentioned was regulation as well and how that can affect us. And a bit of an example here, um, just using sort of infrastructure and a, and a road build, you know, if we decided this year we want a new road somewhere, typically it takes us about 10 years to go through the design process, construction, then we open a new highway, motorway, etc. So we're at 2030. But by 2035, we're bringing in a petrol and diesel vehicle ban in the UK. 
then by 2045, we should all be on electric, hydrogen, maybe even autonomous vehicles. But our design life of the infrastructure isn't until around 2130, the next century. So we have this huge period of design life with a different use than what we've designed it for because we're currently designing for as we're using um, roads and infrastructure now. We're not thinking about how things are going to change. And if we don't do that, again, we don't have a huge amount of resilience because we're going to have a huge amount of costly retrofitting and infrastructure to put in vehicle charging points, perhaps below lane charging. We don't know. So we, we've got to think about these things um, and allow for them, adapt for them where we can just to prevent this, this future cost occurring. And again, a couple of weeks time, we've got another webinar on active travel, which will go over some of this in a, in a bit more detail, which might be interesting for you. Then finally, predictions on future living are important as well. And actually, this is a real big positive from the whole COVID-19 outbreak, is actually flexible working, remote working actually increases our resilience because if we have some transport infrastructure that, that's wiped out because of flooding, because of a heat wave, when we've had some rail lines buckle, if people can go, you know what, it's okay, I can work from home, I can work remotely, it means that that damage, that impact is, is much, much reduced. So it's been great what's happened over the past few months with, with this step towards that. We've got to maintain it. And I think what we need to think about now is what else can we do remotely, um, which might help us as well. We've been working on a site in, in Sweden the past few years, and actually now we're doing site inspections because we can't go there um, through WhatsApp video calls. And it's actually working really well. So, so what else can we do to, to bring in this resilience um, by, by using technology? The other thing to think about, and this is a very difficult subject, is what's socially acceptable loss. We can't protect everything. Sometimes we do need to make a hard call and say, you know what, we, we can't afford or we can't justify making that area resilient, fully adapting it. And actually on the west coast of Wales, we have a, a town called Fairbourne. And a few years ago, the local authority said, actually, we, we can't justify um, protecting this this town from sea level rise we just need to let it let it go so we actually have climate refugees already in the uk and this is only going to increase and we can't all just accept the fact that we need to build concrete flood barriers everywhere um, we don't really want to live in a built environment like that and also that has a huge carbon footprint as well which in, that's what caused the problem in the first place so we've got to think very carefully around that but the sooner we start to think about it the less of an impact it'll have so I'm going to pass back over to David again now, just quickly for a, a quick case study. Wendy, Mr. James, yeah, I just um, thought I would uh, take you through a case study of uh, a recent project I was involved in here in the Midlands for uh, a further education college. Um, low energy design uh, was, you know, uh, always part of the brief effectively, but um, uh, but as we went on in the process, we were, I was able to challenge that to include for future climate scenarios. And I think it, uh, it helped that I was sat in the middle of a sweltering meeting room in the middle of a heat wave with the client having this discussion. Um, but I could see that, you know, the, the risks uh, of the, the, the building not being designed to account for those future climate scenarios uh, wasn't in the client's long term interest. Um, so uh, it, what we were able to do really was uh, together come up with some passive design measures which uh, were, you know, assisted both in the mitigation and adaptation side of things. So we looked very carefully at optimizing the glazing, make, making sure there wasn't uh, too much glazing uh, that was allowing too much heat into the building. Uh, the building used thermal mass as well, uh, an effective passive means of uh, of reducing fluctuations in temperature, and then coupling that with a with a night purge strategy. So, uh, implementing those was able to uh, to to deal with both the mitigation and the adaptation side of things. Um, but when we when we did some further analysis on it, we could see still that some of the uh, some of the building was still at risk uh, of of overheating. So um, we were able to introduce some additional passive measures uh, to increase resilience, and uh, that included cross ventilation and also changes to the night purge routine. Um, but what's important is that it was only through uh, understanding that risk that we were able to uh, address those effectively. Um, 
and it, the the client made the decision to implement these additional measures at the time the building was being designed but that wasn't necessary it isn't always necessary to adapt straight away we could have allowed for provision to introduce these things further down the line if and when uh, it became necessary but it was just the choice on this project uh, to introduce them then so uh, and we did this with the uh, the sibsi future weather files uh, which are, are a good tool for in, um, for looking at overheating in buildings. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, um, you know, just to kind of close out, we're, we're trying to keep up with changes in, uh, in climate, society and, uh, and technology. And, and it's very much a balancing act of, of these things. If we, if we, if if we miss one, we, we lose our resilience. But if we follow the science, uh, you know, observe the, the trends of climate and, and review the risks, uh, then we can build uh, resilient and uh, sustainable environments. So, Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll just have a, a look through the results from the poll from earlier. But if you've got any questions at all, please type them in now. Um, if you think of something later or you want to discuss this, the subject in a, in a bit more detail, please do contact David and myself, happy to chat about it, happy to share what, what we can and everything that we've learned over the past few years when we've been looking at this. So I will just share the results of the poll there. So uh, do you currently consider climate change adaptation? So about two thirds are saying yes, they do. Uh, one, uh, around one third of people are saying they, they don't consider adaptation. Uh, what do you see as being the biggest climate risk to your organization, uh, overheating, flooding, and uh, very interesting energy costs as well? Maybe not necessarily something that was of that much interest to, uh, to some people, but actually it's interesting that that's becoming uh, an increasing uh, concern for people. Uh, and that very much fits together with the, uh, the, the, the discussions on net zero carbon and low energy costs and mitigation that we're having at the moment. And then what do you consider to be the key barrier to adaptation uh, costs and uh, no regulatory requirements, which is, uh, which, yeah, I, I, I agree with, agree with yeah, that. It, so. it, it's, it's interesting to see the, the low percentage for the, <clears throat> the insurance costs actually, because I can see that being the, the big change over the next few years and which might drive it more than the, the regulatory approach is mm. actually going to be a, a requirement from, from insurers to, to prove to them that you're, you're fully adapted to, to changes in climate because a lot of them are doing a huge amount of work on this at the moment. It, it's, a, it's a huge, huge cost for them. Um, so we might find some actually refusals of insurance uh, in the not too distant future um, if people aren't proving that they've, they've got a truly resilient building. Bill, so we have had some questions um, come through. We've got a little bit of time just to, to run through them. Um, so mitigation generally generates cost with regards to the build process. How do we educate clients that reducing these measures for VE is required? Um, well, I think firstly, the, the, the issue of cost is there may be uh, a bit more upfront costs in terms of carrying out risk assessments or sort of maybe increasing the scope of certain elements of the design to allow designers to understand the risks. Um, but I think one of the important things is that you don't necessarily have to, um, uh, you know, create a, a fortress of a building as it were, that is fully adapted from day one. It's, it's, it's partly about how you allow for that as the, as the building um, progresses through its life. So uh, you could allow for certain elements to be retrofitted in the future as and when are required. Because, you know, as I said, we don't quite know what trajectory emissions will take. We could end up with a two degree temperature rise. It could be a four degree temperature rise. The responses to adapt to your building will probably be dependent on what that is so by sort of um ha having this adaptation plan you can then implement these at the appropriate time but, is it, but you know and in doing so you don't it's, incur those it's costs a bit about you. think about where your risks lie really and and what you can afford to lose because say you're operating a, a shopping center and you have a heat wave and you don't have a cooling strategy in place i think about what foot forward you lose during that period what will that cost you that might be an acceptable cost compared to the 
the, how much it might cost you to adapt it. But it's a case of going through that process first and understanding it. And then you can see what's worth doing, what isn't. You're kind of risk assessing and, and doing a cost benefit analysis against all of this as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, is there a standard methodology to measure climate risk? Um, there are a handful depending on what area you're measuring climate risk. So, so the TCFD has some very good guidance uh, and frameworks on uh, measuring and um, disclosing climate risk in uh, sort of more from an investment perspective. Um, and then from an organizational perspective, there's uh, emerging guidance um, in it's European st or International Standard 14090, which is part of the ISO 14001 yeah. suite yeah, of documents. It's kind of, th there is that document there that is a British standard now as well. But mm. to be honest, it, it's, it's very brief. It, it's, it's not very user friendly, I would say. Um, but it, in summary, it just says, um, do a risk assessment. <laughs> that, that that's pretty much the the entire yeah. um 30 page document summarized so it, it's not a, a great place to look for for how you should go about something i mean by all means read it um hopefully it'll get improved as things go go on but it's it's not not brilliant and just that they are there uh the the iso 14091 standard is going to build on that and uh, and is supposed to add a bit more of a practical element to how you can do these risk assessments um so hopefully that gives a bit uh, more robustness in the uh, the methodology to use. I'm not sure if you've just answered this question. Um, so what building design guides do you recommend for architects and engineers on adaptation and mitigation? Um, so Innovate UK ran a project about four or five years ago um, where they gave funding to certain design teams uh, and projects to just explore uh, and hopefully implement some adaptation strategies to try and understand what some of the barriers were uh, in the industry to this. Uh, and the outcome from that was uh, there's both a report and a, a published book called Design for Climate Change. Um, and that's, that's fantastic. It's not uh, a kind of it's not a step-by-step -step guide or anything like that, but it gives an idea of what some of the different solutions that design teams actually looked at to, to uh, implement adaptation. Um, and, and that is very good. And um, shameless uh, plug uh, uh, also, oh I um, the, the report that I uh, recently published for the British Council for Offices is very much meant to act as a guide as well um, for what types of things to look at so yeah. uh, I, I would say a good place to start as well is actually just to have a look through the UK climate projections reports um, because they actually provide the basis for, for a lot of this or, or likewise if you're in a different part of the world looking at your local equivalent because that'll give you an understanding there of what's actually going to change because we're not actually designing for anything new here we, you know, we designed for flooding already we designed for overheating already it's just the degree of that so it's a combination of understanding what those changes are but also understanding your existing design guidance you're not going to be designing in a different way or using different standards it's just what factors or, or, or levels of change you're applying during your existing design so again as i mentioned before you need to think about what is that guidance you're using now? What does that use? Is it appropriate? Is it up to date? Perfect, thank you. I, I realise we're a couple of minutes over, so we have got a few more questions to, to answer. What we'll do is we'll send um, those answers via email just so we don't take up any more of your time this morning, or this afternoon. So um, I'll thank the speakers. So thanks, James and David, for your presentation this morning. Um, as I said earlier, it will be going on to YouTube um, later on in the week. So if you missed anything or would like to share it with your, your colleagues, then you can check it out there. Um, and if you can just move to the next slide, we've got a few more webinars um, as both James and David referred to, um, which will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. So if you've got any questions or would like to register, just have a look on our website um, and you can find the links to that there. So thank you again to everybody for your time this morning and for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you. you.